street and you'll see a great green building and that uh, is Level Maxwell's pride of place. In 1804, he had become a very successful businessman, boat uh, builder, etc. Across the street is Tasha Asdeen's home. Uh, well, it was his store. It was a new store soon after the fire here at the Baptist Church in 1778. Our home uh, on the Baptist Church property, which was Brown University. So when they had to rebuild, our Providence made them a better offer, and so that's how we lost Brown. And um, across the street is the Industrial National Bank, which was the Warren Bank. Um, it has the most beautiful safe in the whole world, full of brass and copper. It's just gorgeous. Of course, it's gone out of business now. Okay, here we go. And this little area here was the site of a, a carriage house. And um, about 30 years ago, the carriage house migrated down the street and now is the site of the Federal Blues, um, which is, and it's an armory as well as their site. And um, it's going to be open so you can have a peek in, if nothing more. The house coming up here on the right um, belonged originally to Judge Samuel Randall. And he was married to um, the woman who was known as Patty Maxwell, one of six daughters of the Maxwell. And uh, in the last few years, they have done a marvelous job bringing it back to what it was, removing plastic and everything and getting it back to this gorgeous state. Don't go away. <laughs> well, it's multiple, and um, they do have um, a small area that belongs to Warren Preservation, and they have their artifacts there. And um, this afternoon, there's going to be um, a little talk on gardens, um, kind of yard gardens. So this then is the mason. And you just want to take a walk inside, or you can just look at the outside. Uh, just take a peek around. Uh, these gentlemen have been very kind enough to say that they will keep the house open in the course of the day for a nip in if you get a chance. Because the murals are worth the trip, I swear. Is there a 30 second visit? Yes. Okay. Welcome um, to Washington Lodge number three. Just a minute, please. Uh, this is the second oldest Masonic Lodge building in the country. Uh, the oldest one is in Alexandria, Virginia, George Washington's Lodge. You can understand why they've made the effort to keep that building up. Uh, this one was constructed in 1799. It was built by 21 sea captains who were members of this lodge, uh, who founded it in 1796 in Cole's Tavern, which you can't see anymore, but it was just down the street. Um, our oral tradition states that the lodge is actually constructed out of sunken British frigates uh, that were sunken during the uh, when the French came and blockaded the harbor. The British scuttled their fleet. We believe that one of those frigates was raised and brought up here and turned into the upstairs portion of the lodge building in particular, as in they turned the thing upside down. And when you come back, and I know you will, and you see the upstairs lodge room, it has the full arc of a ship, humble home and all. Um, in the early 1900s, after 100 years of use, the lodge was in a bit of a state of disrepair. The masons refurbished it, and that included uh, frescoes, murals on the upstairs portion of the, of the lodge, which are Egyptian. 
They're taken directly out of the papyrus of Annie, out of the Egyptian Book of the Dead. They were done by a RISD student, uh, Max Mueller, who was a member of this lodge. They are gorgeous. And uh, the lodge room is nothing you would possibly expect to find in a little town like Warren. This room was the town hall for uh, nearly 100 years. Um, we rented it out to the town. The Warren Academy for Girls was also down here. That was the counterpart to the school that was over at the Baptist Church. They went on to be Brown University. The girls' school, uh, I think, got folded uh, into the it town. It went system. down to be a seminary, which later burned, uh, but it was quite a, a focal point of the womanly arts. Lots of embroidery and things like that. Ladies so, didn't move around in those days. To answer your question, this being the town hall, the fireproof safe was added to the building uh, to protect the most valuable thing the town held at the time, which was the postage stamps. They had to be safely guarded. <coughs> yeah, there's two or two big safes in there. One of them is enormous. Have, I'm sorry, but we have to move on. There on a, a kind of a loose That's schedule. Miller and Son. It's Miller and Son makers. Mind if I in about half an hour. Because it got reversed in the George is going to tell us about his... Okay. okay, this fire, fire barn, okay, what they used to call it back in the old days, was down on Water Street, down, just down in the area of the town. And what they did was, they, this building was built in 1846. They moved it from down on Water Street to this piece of property. This is town land here, and next door is the town land. But originally, the fire station was over on, the fire barn, was over on the common, okay, on the east side of the common, right facing Church Street. They didn't have the time, they did not have this piece of apparatus, okay. I tell everybody that piece of apparatus, which was built in 1802, has never ever left Warren. It's always been in town. And a lot of people find that hard to believe because most of the time, People that have fire departments that have these pieces of equipment either sell them or they get them back or one or the other or they disappear completely. Okay, so it's always been in the town of Warren, but that was the first piece of apparatus they bought, and it was like four hundred dollars to buy that. Okay, and they did it by public subscription. Mm -hmm. Wow! And the first name on the list was James Maxwell because he was one of the money people in the town. That was built in 1802 up in Boston by Thayer, that's who built it, okay? So what they did was, they outgrew, over on the common there was this piece of apparatus, the town hearse, okay? And if you look on the wall over there's a picture of a ladder truck and that was over there. So, so what they had to do was they outgrew the place so they decided they'd build this fire barn down there and bring it up here. This fire station is all built post and beam. It's all post and beam, okay? I found that out by doing a little investigation in the building itself, okay? Um, it's, it's been here since 1846 on this piece of property, okay? This is not the original floor. The original floor was dirt, okay? The back there was not there. The, the, the station ended right at that door. So what happened eventually, what became, became motorized, they had a fire truck in here, regular fire truck in here, okay? And they, before that, they had, a, they had a steamer in here. They had a steamer. We don't know, we know where the steamer went, but we were never able to get it, okay? And so they had the steamer in here. But then they outgrew that, so then they got rid of that, then they brought a fire, a regular fire truck in here. This was the Narragansett Fire Station, which eventually was over there where the rescue station is over on Miller Street, okay? There was a school there at one time, the school burned down, and they built a fire station. 
they moved the fire truck out of here over there, so this place was vacant for a long time. Then, uh, the, the, I think it was the DAV took it over, and it was a storage area. You go upstairs and look around, you'll see a picture of this place, what shape it was in. And if anybody remembers, back in the 70s, they had this federal money, they call it CETA money. Oh, yes. Okay. They had, uh, they got a a ton of money. They had this fellow, Lombard Posey. Anybody ever hear of Lombard Posey who passed oh, yeah. away last year? He was the architect for this building. And we had two people from the town that worked on this and put it back originally the way it was. And this is how you see it as it was back then. This is the... So crawling around up in the attic one day, found the flag. And if you look at that flag, how many stars are on that flag? <laughs> 48, 48, yeah. so I found that up there, so I hung that up there. But a lot of the, st a lot of the stuff that's in here was donated by some of the people in town, and a lot of, one of the, two of the fire companies have a lot of their, their uh, memorabilia in here. When I took this place over to get it, it like a halfway decent museum, all the stuff you see on the wall was just laid around on the floor, on, the, on behind and everything. So I came in and I spent a whole winter in here putting stuff away. But what I did was I locked it all up because we have, if you look at those cabinets, there's some real heirlooms. You know, there's trumpets and there's, you know, the old stuff in here. If you look at those red dress shirts, those were the dress shirts that the fire department, the fire companies had. In fact, they used to go to, they called them fairs back in the old days, which now is busters. Okay. So one day in my infinite wisdom, I took one of the shirts out and I opened it up, okay? I have a grandson who was not a real big boy. He couldn't even get into that shirt. That's how small those people were back in those days. Okay? It's amazing. You know, different diets and how they ate and everything else was different. But anyways, we, we had our anniversary for the fire department in 2002. So we put this in the parade. We had new wheels made for it down in in Pennsylvania, one of the Amish people made the wheels. The original ones are upstairs. When you walk around, you see the original ones. And we took it down to Bristol Park. We had a big muster with all the hand tubs and everything. And we actually got water out of that. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. yeah. So, Not yeah. with that hose, but with regular hose. I was just going to say. <laughs> okay. But this, okay. this is our hero. That's we, its name. But we, hero. Did, but we did get water out of it, you know, because the pack is in there of leather. But I'll give you a, a, a little bit of history on that, how we almost lost that. When you folks go down to St. Mary the Bay Church, there's a funeral home, over a model funeral home. Across the street, you'll see this big, beautiful building. It's a Mott Memorial now. They had a big uh, horse barn down in the back. This ended up in the horse barn because at the time, I guess they had no room to store this. So then they decided to tear the horse barn down. This was in the barn. So one of the people that were down there doing, the, doing it, in infinite wisdom, called the town up to up on Main Street and said, hey, there's something in here might people be interested in. So they went down and got it, and they put it upstairs in the library, George Hill <laughs> Library, upstairs. It was there for quite a while, right? Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. George and I go way back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we have to move along, yep. but I really think that George gets a round of applause. Yes. He yeah. brought this to what it is now. Fifth generation in this fire department. One second, because if I go there, fifth generation. Volunteer fire department. Fifth generation. current commander of the Warren Federal Blues. I am a commissioned captain in the Rhode Island Militia. And before you today, it's my pleasure to present to you Pallas and Tante. Now these two cannons are very fabled in their history. In fact, these are Warren's oldest veterans. These are veterans of the American Revolution. These saw service in every single one of the Continental Army campaigns. In fact, these two guns were cast in France in Strasbourg which 
If you remember, Strasbourg and Alsace-Lorraine goes back and forth between France and Germany every couple hundred years. Uh, depending on the wars. Yeah, depending on the wars. Uh, this one, this is Pallas, was cast in 1760, and Tante down there was cast in 1762. And they're interchangeable. They are. They have the exact same gun. They're identical twins. Uh, these two guns were brought over to the New World during the French and Indian War, where they stayed in the Quebec area and were captured with the rest of Canada from the French. Now, General Burgoyne took these two guns in his ill-fated attempt to split New England off from the rest of the 13 colonies during the Revolution in his march down the Hudson Valley. These two guns were captured from him and they were put into the Continental Artillery Park under General Knox. Now, they stayed with the Continental Army all the way up through the American Revolution. After the war was over, Rhode Island being a very independent people, not wanting to go with the rest of the crowd, decided not to ratify the Constitution. We were kind of dragging our feet. So General Washington, at the time, decided it would be a good idea to try to butter up Rhode Island a bit. <laughs> so he presented these two guns to the United Train of Artillery, which was then stationed in Providence. So these two cannons came to Rhode Island through a general direct gift from General Washington. <laughs> now, these two guns remained in the United Train of Artillery Armory on Benefit Street in Providence, all the way up through the Door Rebellion. Now, Thomas Dorr decided that our old charter, which was the form of our government, wasn't really working. So he decided that he was going to overthrow the elected governor and create a governor more people-based, where everyone could vote. So Dorr raised himself a little militia, and he marched on the State House. Now, the members of the United Train of Artillery, although they're not really labeled as this in history, but believed were sympathetic to Dorr and kind of left the armory doors open for them. So they took, the Dorrites took these two cannons, put them into earthworks and aimed them right at the state house in an attempt to threaten the governor into going his way. But when the other militia units, Governor King, who was the elected governor, called up the state militia and they marched on the Dorite encampment across the street from the State House. And when they saw the militias coming up the road, they fled. They ended up in Chapachet. And they left these two guns behind. Now, when the Warren militia ran on top of the earthwork and saw these two guns, they said, these are ours. <laughs> so they very secretively put them into a hay cart and stole them and brought them to Warren. And the Warren Artillery Armory on Jefferson Street, underneath the stage, had a special compartment that was made solely for the purpose of hiding these two barrels. <laughs> and they stayed there for several years until Governor King passed uh, a general order validating anything that was done by the militia in the name of the state of Rhode Island, which included seizing these two cannons. So that is how the United Train of Artillery lost them and how Warren gained them which was actually a bone of contention with the United Train of Artillery for a good long time. Uh, they really wanted them back, but they, they really didn't have a leg to stand on because the government gave them to us. Now, these two guns stayed out in front of the Warren Town Hall for a, a pretty much as long as any local can remember, and they sat there and did absolutely nothing except rot. Both of the carriages rotted away completely, so the barrels were then taken off of the carriages and put in the town transfer yard just as a safe place because you could lock it and that's where it stayed. And they stayed languishing there for years on end until finally one day they just disappeared. Nobody knew where they went. So eventually they found these cannons cut into pieces at the bottom of the pond at Roger Williams Park. The idea was that Someone at the town yard figured that no one was ever going to come back for these. The town didn't want them, so they should just get rid of them. And both of these guns are 800 pounds of bronze, which is very expensive if you recycle it. Now, they cut them here, here, and here. All of the, all of the engraving 
all of the dolphins were all ground off. So it was just smooth. Now when the report went out that these cannons were missing and the state police started looking everywhere for them, the people who had them, to this day we still don't know who did it, whoever took them dumped them in the pond at Roger Williams Park and they stayed there for about 20 years until one summer there was a sort of a drought, it was really dry and the water level in the pond went way down and you could see the cut up pieces of the cannon just laying in the mud. So it was reported and the state police took possession and they did their own investigation and determined that these were in fact the missing Warren cannons. So then the state police transferred them to the Warren police station where they stayed in the, the evidence locker in the basement <laughs> of the Warren police station for a bunch of years just in a pile. It was just cannon pieces. And then from there, once they came back to Warren, it was decided by the Warren Federal Blues that because we're the town's militia, and these were our guns, not so much our unit, but Warren's guns, that we should take it upon ourselves to try to restore them. So we reached out to the United Train of Artillery, who owned them originally, and in a cooperative effort between the two organizations, we raised over $38,000 to have these restored. Now, all of this work that you see was all done by Cannons Online, which is a foundry in Maryland that makes cannons basically for uh, Civil War reenactors, Revolutionary War reenactors, much smaller scale. And they agreed to try to restore these. So what they did was they took all of the pieces together and they bored holes into each of the sections and they s inserted steel pins and then they sleeved them all together. So basically the only thing holding this together is its own gravity and those little steel pins. To give it added support they actually put a steel sleeve down the, down the center of the tubes just to give it that added balance. Uh, all of this work that you see was all redone from one of the other cannons, its other sister, which is at West Point. They were able to take a rubbing of the Royal Cipher, which is on each of these cannons. Uh, this is the Royal Cipher of King Louis XV, who was the monarch in France at the time. Uh, all of the, the Strasbourg, the dolphins were actually missing also. They couldn't find the dolphins in the mud. So what they did was they got permission from the curator of the museum at West Point to make a cast of the dolphins that were on top of the sister gun that was there. So from that, that mold, they were able to recast the dolphins in bronze and reattach them to each of the barrels. Uh, one of the tragic stories in this is actually that muzzle section of Tante they could not find in the mud. That was missing. Nobody knows where that went. But they were able to make a mold out of the muzzle end of Pallas and create an extra piece. And they actually attached it to the end of the gun just so it was complete. So that actually the end of that gun is only about a quarter of an inch thick. Whereas the rest of the guns are solid bronze. I'm sorry. We have to move along. Oh, I'm this I'm got, sorry, to, I'm you. This hey, got hey. too interesting yes. for me. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it, the um, manager who we at the armory was one of the wounding uh, federal blues to getting these back. Uh, Ed Theberge, uh, who seems to devote a lot of time to Warren. And um, these are really a pride for us. They really are. We all worked on it with money, you know, and raising um, through all the different tea parties and everything that you have to do to raise money. Because preservation does not come cheap, but it requires a lot of cooperation. These were actually these were the chain hoists that they would use to wish the gun off. Um, this house is. <laughs> <laughs> the Hale Collins house. And Hale Collins married uh, first one of the, uh, I'm sorry, it's Amanda, um, married one of the Maxwell daughters. And she died only four years into their marriage, probably birthing a child that was kind of. And then he married another sister. So they must have been very congenial. This house belonged to
to Lombard Posey. And this past summer, I got the surprise of my life because, poor darling, he died. But he had thought long and hard about what he was going to do with this house. And he bequested it to Massasoit Historical Association along with the money for the upkeep. Wow. You never hear that your whole life. And after 20 years of doing, you know, the minor things that you do to raise money for a small organization, uh, to have this as a wonderful memory of, of Lombard, but also he trusted us to keep it up and to do what he had planned for it. So, uh, you know, it's, it's just a beautiful, beautiful part of what was a wonderful man. He, he was so helpful to us over many years in our um, preservation of just Massasoit Historical. Now we're going to cross the street. All right. Now, this playground here is on the site of the baker, Virginia Baker, the lady who wrote the history of Warren, probably a lot of the apocryphal, but um, anyway, that, uh, <laughs> that was the Baker home, and it uh, burned, and then was turned into something very useful and this beautiful. Nice. Now, this section in here, according to uh, history, was one of the uh, winter camping grounds for Massasoit. So the spring that we're just going to look at the marker uh, is to the Massasoit. And you can, you just have to imagine that there was nothing here but trees, fresh water year round, and then it's shelved right down to the beach. It, of course, the configuration of the land has changed. It would have been warm for, in the winter because you'd have the, the trees at your back and the western sun, and you'd have your shelving um, beach for your canoes and things like that. Good grief, is this the most popular tree in town? So, the, when you said fresh water year round. Was now, that, this yeah. was the spring, yeah. oh, the spring and it right. was a free running spring yeah. until the 60s when uh, <laughs> the water used to go down right down to the beach and you just kind of puddle jumped around, you know, to get down there. But in the 60s, um, they played games and put washing powder in the spring uh, and, you know, all the things that the 60s did. So this is the marker for the, um, the spring, and in 1907 it was dedicated and it was still running water. It's only up until about the late 60s that it was packed, and then they put big rocks over it, and, which made my gardening very difficult, mm. because you've got about this much space between huge rocks. Mm -hmm. uh, but it marks the site. We even had at that time in, in 1907, because um, Massasoit, which was known as the Monument Society at that point, uh, had worked on this. And so we had a representative of the Wampanoag Indians. And the Massasoit was the sachem, which wasn't really a chief. He was one of the uh, perhaps six uh, reigning uh, groups, and they would uh, get together and make decisions. And prior to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, they had had a scourge of, of a disease which had killed off a great many of the Wampanoags. So they were down to about 300. Now this was still part of Massachusetts, and in 1636, when Roger Williams uh, was proposing that people should do as their conscience told them, 
uh, they turfed him out in the middle of winter. They wanted him to die. And he came to this, uh, to Soams, to Coconauca, because he had heard that Massasoit was welcoming to the settlers. And he spent the winter here, and then he was told that they were still after his neck. And so Massasoit uh, gave him canoes and Indians to take him around to Providence, and that was the settling for Providence. So we've lost great people. <laughs> we, lo we lost Brown and we lost Roger Williams. Uh, they would have ranged all the way up of Bristol. Oh, so this up. is A, Yeah, but 1907, and they were kind of a squinting group in the um, 80s, 90s. But what did they do? Did you do the same? And designs, and even had some of the materials collected. So that's what we're doing. Oh, I, if we could just stop for a minute, we'll talk about um, Warren had just been incorporated in 1747, and Warren was named for um, an Irish uh, general uh, from the French and Indian Wars. He was kind of like the um, flavor of the month, uh, the popular general at the time. Uh, much like uh, Schwarzkopf would have been um, recently. If you look at the way that these bricks are done, you won't see them anymore because they are a European pattern. It's called Flemish Bond, and it's two bricks running lengthways and one running through. Now, when you look at it, you don't realize until you really look at it how they use small decorative ways of making it pretty. Lovely. And uh, so that the ends that I always tell the children when I'm doing tours is that they got cooked too much like your mother's cookies. You know, they were baked more as they were preserved, as they were doing the bricks. Uh, some of the artifacts that they found in the course of uh, construction uh, over on the table. And this board here, in our research, we have only discovered two others, and they are in Canada. This is a scale board. And it's a design of a boat, and this is what the design looks like, scratched into the wood. Now, this board had a history because it, um, in, in the days when they were selling boats and building boats down here on the waterfront, that was a little tiny boat yacht. It's still a boat yacht. Mm -hmm. So we are intimately related to them, and Massaso uh, Maxwell family is intimately related. Uh, because in about 10 years after this house was completed, it was started by um, the Reverend Samuel Maxwell. He was a man well along in years. He was into his 70s when, in 1752, he signed for this house and began construction. In 1756, it was completed, and the, the Samuel and his wife, Joanna, and his son and son-in-law, a daughter-in-law, and their two small boys, James and Level, moved into this house. They split it top to bottom so that the grandparents had access for their lifetime of half the house to dry clothes upstairs and for um, preserving food downstairs. Now, back to the... <laughs> In about five years after they moved in, the young father died. He had tuberculosis, which was 
uh, fatal in those days. And later on, the young wife married one of the workmen at the boatyard. We had a fire in the house perhaps 15 years later, and it burned into a, a ceiling going upstairs to the second floor, which I'm not inviting you to do today. <laughs> so um, he went down back to the um, boatyard, looked down their discard pile, found this board, and thought, hmm, close enough for government oh work, <laughs> and up it went, and it went up, fortunately, the right way. Oh my God! So that in 1976, when they were reviewing places to put our um, air conditioning oh. and heating so that we could preserve this building, the man who was doing it was a workman from Newport who was a sailor. But beyond a sailor, he was an historian sailor. Wow. So he's going around, you know, this way, and he sees this, and he knew what he was looking at, even though he had never seen one. But they had always speculated that there must be these. And I'm sure that in other houses all over New England, somewhere, there are scale boards. But this one, um, and you have to stand pretty much where Dom is standing <laughs> in order to see the, the things. Because in order to preserve it, we had to dust it. Now that took away all the nice markings uh, from... Uh, <laughs> sometimes a little dust is a good thing. So this is what it would have looked like in its construction stage. And over on the table is a book that shows what it would look like as a grown-up boat. It would have been 55 feet long. It was called a coastal schooner. And these are the boats that you read about in the, in the Revolution that would um, supply New York and New Jersey because they were agile and they could evade the British boats. And uh, so that's the story on our scale board. Why is it it's, scale um, it, it's out of wood because a board did not disintegrate the way paper did. Also, you didn't have to pay taxes on it. The only thing you had to be careful of was that it did not exceed two feet wide because a tree that was two feet wide belonged to the king mm -hmm. and he took violent exception if you cut down his trees and he hung you. So <laughs> well, when, the <laughs> well the thing is that when you look at something like this or you look at the little windows that we have in restoration glass, this is the story of the revolution. The intolerable acts are right here. Right. You know, just wow. the daily, daily dumb annoyances of having to pay for glass because glass would not be made in the United States. It had to come from England. That's why small panes, they lasted on the boats. Big ones broke. So you had little ones. Uh, it's an amazing, amazing story when uh, <laughs> You hang around this place <laughs> long enough. <laughs> they, uh, they all go up separately to a central flue, and you'll notice the big um, fire of uh, the big chimney. That beehive oven, beehive oven over on the side. So if you see a house that um, has a the beehive oven on the side with sometimes um, wood. Um, storage. storage underneath. That, that's after, after the revolution. the revolution. I do colonial dinners on this heart. <laughs> and for many, many years I would be here under this. And it would give you a little turn every so often, you know, when you're looking up at rocks. I w was beginning to think that I was going to be part of the witches from Salem. Oh so, 
Uh, anyway, we got a grant and shored up the ceiling. Now, there are some original beams, uh, this one being one, um, and there's another one down here. So when you're here and you're thinking, this was cut on the land, and it was, it had to have been, been growing for about 30 years to be big enough to do this with, you, you're talking about 300 years, you know, above your head. So uh, we, we try very hard. It's going to be whitewashed again because that was the tradition. I hate to see it, but they convinced me that this is the way it should be. Uh, the beehive oven works beautifully. We do bread and rolls and things like that. The only thing I can't get is uh, John Cheney, who is our guru on cooking, to do pizza because it would be perfect. But he tells me <laughs> he tells me that it's not historically correct. So anyway, um, now if you're coming back at any time in the course of the day, John has done some wonderful tours on DVD, uh, that way you can just sit and put your feet up and enjoy and have a little trek down Water Street or Main Street. James was the elder. When he and Lovell were four and two and they moved into this house, and then, of course, by the time he was nine, his father had died. And no money. So they began running errands and doing things for the boat builders because at that stage in Warren's development, this road here was not uh, continued down this far. This was just a dirt way that went up to Main Street. And they continued on. One of them apprenticed for a while to be a brass monger. So he was doing the fittings for the different boats that were being built. And as they got older, they used possibly this room as a ship's chandlery. And they worked with the boat builders. When they couldn't be paid in money, they were paid in land. So they had little plots of land all over town, which was very good because he had six daughters. So he had six dowries. So when I mention Maxwell, it's because it's all over town. It's like a giant spider web coming out of this one building. You have Samuel Randall, who married a Maxwell. You have Hale Collins, who married two. You have um, Eileen Collins' house, which we will pass very shortly, because we're supposed to be on a schedule, um, is another Dower house. Now, there are a couple that didn't make it, which is unfortunate. But these were all built close to 1800, 1804 in there, because this is when the girls would have grown and married and uh, done their thing. Now, I think. I guess I think we'll go out this door. We don't know if we're at home. Yes, we are. But you can see under that terrible asbestos stuff that there's, an, there's loads of 18th century houses on this street. It's wonderful. Pat, I have a question about the Brown University. The, the, the Baptist Church, were they the ones Okay, so the yeah. Baptist Church here. And, and, and the, it was on the grounds, and it was in their meeting house. Uh -huh. And in 1778, when the British came and made the raid on Warren, uh -huh. they burned it. Because oh, okay. it was a seat of insurrection, you sure. know that. <laughs> like Education they are today. is a dangerous <laughs> that's thing. That's right, that's right. Now, this <laughs> gorgeous number here is our uh, Methodist Church. And it's our treasure, among other things. It was erected in about 1907.
it was the Soldiers and Sailors Monument. It was raised by public subscription, and a lot of it was done by Ma the monuments, which was Massasoit Historical Association. And, and that became kind of like the Rotary. It was a group of movers and shakers, all men, of course. And it was, um, it was done to preserve the historic places, but also to attract and uh, new people, new businesses into the town. And it was to attract new people, new life into the town. And uh, so that was one of the moving forces in uh, our organization. Uh, they came in and took this house when we were scared to death that it was going to go to some horrible thing. And they have done this gorgeous job with it. And that golden beech tree came over with the sailor captain. Interesting trees because of the maritime connection. And uh, when I was a little girl, the people who lived in this house had, had granddaughters. And we were allowed to have tea parties under that wonderful, wonderful tree. Uh, so when it was for sale, you know, your heart hurts because you simply don't want to lose. Uh, in the first place, it's beautiful. And in the second place, it's, it's part of you. Now, we're going to go down here, put my mill. Uh, there was money there, and that's another uh, house that is plaqued, and I think it's uh, in the 18, early 1800s. And this was a dower house uh, from a Maxwell daughter. Oh, oh, not another one, huh? Well, when you have six, yeah. I know. It's amazing. Yeah. It's absolutely um, amazing. It might as well pull this town Maxwell. <laughs> Now, um, I think in terms of accessibility, let's just walk up this street. Other corner while we have a chance. This building has been brought back from the dead. It was the Cole Hotel, which burned, and then it was the Goff Hotel. And then it fell into disuse and was very tragic for a long time. And the gentleman who owned it was determined that it would go back to what it had been at the Goff Hotel. Here is Delectus Pharmacy. It started out as an apothecary, then it was the pharmacy. It has the best coffee cabinet in the world. And that is our town hall. That's our town, but we have three armories. Oh my goodness. Now, uh, in uh, the course of the lifetime, this uh, was given as a gift to the town in 1842 for service during the Dole Rebellion. And uh, it had had a life and a curve, and the curve was going downward. And Ed Thieberge and um, General Valente and a few more of us got together and thought that maybe we could do something with it, which we are. So you will see how far along we have come. <laughs> but um, it, it, those things at the top of the towers are going to go. We're going to go back to crenellation <laughs> eventually. But in the meantime, it looks like bottle caps to me. And um, now we're going to go along 
you will be coming back here for the reception at the end of the day. Right. So you'll oh, enjoy it. Yes. Okay. This is the arm. I'd like to thank you all for coming to the George Hale Library today. Um, it's too bad the weather is the way it is, but, you know, you're here, and that's the, that's the main thing. Uh, this building is 125 years old this year. It was built to be a library. A lot of people, when they come in, think it was church. a private home or a church, yeah. Yeah. and we can always tell first-timers because they're always looking up yeah. at the ceiling. Uh -huh. So... Um, <clears throat> This gentleman back in the late 1970s uh, did a restoration of the library and a lot of the, the painting was done, a lot of drop ceilings were taken out, this carpet was uh, installed so now it's okay to look down at the floor <laughs> instead of up. Um, and the carpet is 100% wool and it's held up very, very well over 30 years. There's very little wear in it. Um, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful carpet, and it really adds to the look of the building. <coughs> this is one of Warren's little gems. Um, the town is very proud of it. Um, for a library this old, we provide 21st century library services. We're wireless. We have internet computers, so people come in and say, do you have the internet here? I'm like, yes. <laughs> Anyways, that's not what you're here for. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, do you want to talk about that a little bit, that painting? Uh, oh, it's okay. here with its home in the library uh, so that everyone in Warren can enjoy it because you know yourself anything that's a, a museum or a preservation thing you get one and two you don't get groups so this is what we thought and we were right but it is lovely we have a museum upstairs and I think Pat would like you to see her pride and uh, she might know the name of the museum. Can you tell us about the raccoon? Is he just from somebody's collection? <laughs> or? Well, it's part of a collection uh, from many years ago. I can remember uh, there was an owl in here that um, I was quite sure it was one of the old librarians and they just stopped her and kept her. But, um, well, you know when you're kids. Yeah. <laughs> We know he was a ship's captain. If you look in the background, you can kind of see the ocean, yeah. and you can see a couple of ships. Who painted him? We have absolutely no idea. It's one of our projects. We hope to find out someday, but at the moment, we don't know. But it's much better than an itinerant painter, because they just oh. did yes. the bodies oh, yes. and then yes. filled in the faces. Yes. That and, was, that you was know. Well done, well done. But isn't that beautiful? He was a handsome gentleman. This yes. one, we don't have any idea of who it is. Um, the staff think, well, never mind. He looks kind of grouchy. This <laughs> man looks at least approachable, like you mm -hmm. can say hello. Yeah. But this man looks grouchy. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what the staff thinks. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I was just in one day. It isn't George Hale. No, George Hale is back here oh, on, this, on this wall. Um, he was a very wealthy businessman that went to Prov he comes from Warren and he went to Providence established the American Screw Company and when he retired he came back into town and did a lot of philanthropic work and when he died his wife wanted a suitable memorial to his name so she left the town their house and some money with the understanding that the town would sell the house and use the proceeds and the money to build the library, provided that they called it the George Hale Library. So there was a little string attached with the money. Um, she was really the driving force behind the library. Uh, we know very little about her. There's a portrait of him. We don't have a picture or a portrait, nothing. We have no idea what she looked like. Um, but we're very grateful to her and to George because we're in this gorgeous building. Um, it cost about $18,000 to build the building, which by today's standards is laughable, but back then that was a lot of money. However, they did try to cut costs. They used wood wherever they could pick it up at a good bargain. So you'll see um, cherry is in here, 
mahogany is in here, <laughs> walnuts in here, and I think there's another yeah. type of wood, but I'm not I'm not yeah. sure what that is. Well, we have a scrimshaw collection. We have fire buckets and a nice collection from the town's fire department. Burst Hill. Hill is down on Water Street, oh. heading south. Now it's the town's um, baseball, field. baseball fields, playground, that type of thing. When they ran the railroad through back around 1914, 1915, right around then, they dug up an Indian burial ground, a Native American burial ground. So a lot of the things were taken out, excavated, that's Burr's Hill. They came to this library, they went to the Half and Repper, and the rest of them went to the um, Museum of the American Indian in New York City. Which but because of NAGPRA, they've all been reclaimed by the Indian, by the Native American tribes. Oh. The things in this case are all Native oh. American artifacts, but they all came from the Kickapoo River and up in the farmlands. So these are not burial artifacts, yeah. so those we were able to keep. Free, yeah. Robbins Museum in Middleborough, I believe it is, and a few other places. Vermont? No, this was around here, I think. Yeah. But they never mentioned the one in the George Hill Library, so they talked about what they thought they were used for, but that's all I can tell you. Yeah. Just, it no, looks like just a stone. Just entertainment. It's a, it's a just a it's a yeah, however they did it. Yeah, it's not, yeah. It's a there is a key, but it's almost useless. So if you're coming back and you're walking to go somewhere, just take a little segue, oh, look at okay, that, okay. and then you will have completed my tour. Well, thank you. But <laughs> it's wonderful so happy happy you have your little so sides. Thank you. Thank you so much. When well, you're this well. Was great. This was great. Isn't yes, it good? Yes, yes, I can project for only so long. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 